Um, I first had some uh, conversations with some people in the semiconductor industry that had a that had a problem of this form where they were they were trying to sell um, their product uh, a device in the semiconductor industry to um, to sort of a portfolio of customers and these contracts had different different terms on them they lasted over different um, time frames different time scales they had um, different economic parameters in them they were structured in different ways and there was a portfolio of them and so um, and so it occurred to me that uh, this sort of situation occurs very commonly. Uh, companies have many different kinds of contracts with different kinds of customers and this general question of how do you optimize that portfolio of contracts. In the case of BP, um, they had just invested or were in the process of investing significant billions of dollars into this Whiting refinery um, in Indiana so it can process um, Canadian heavy crude. Um, and because of that, then the big concern in this group was to figure out how to best sell that, um, sell the gasoline that comes as output from that. And the debate in this case was uh, a significant number of people were wanting to sell all of the gasoline, or the vast majority of the gasoline through these long-term contracts, um, in particular through the, their branded BP gas stations. On the notion that that's uh, sort of a long-term commitment uh, and uh, uh, and fairly stable demand. Um, there was another group inside the firm, though, who thought that they should sell the gasoline through what's called the unbranded channel. Uh, and the unbranded channel is is uh, to like Costco's and Safeways and those kinds of uh, companies who will just merely place an order for uh, a contract for a year's worth of quantity uh, instead of having this very long-term contract. That's obviously a lot more risky because uh, because next year Costco could go to Shell uh, and and buy their gasoline, uh, and so uh, because of some risk aversion, they felt that you know we should really um, uh, some you know there was this debate, and so uh, in reality, of course, there's some optimal portfolio, and uh, and so the question is, can we build a model to help BP think about? Uh, and optimize that portfolio, how much should they, how much of their capacity should they hold back for this unbranded channel um, versus committing to this long-term branded channel. And then of course there's a spot market that, that overlays all this, so anything left over uh, after all these contracts are satisfied um, will get sold in a spot market or they could also go to the spot market to make up um, uh, shortages. Um, so, so basically it's trying to understand uh, how sh they should optimize um, these three channels simultaneously. Oftentimes when I do these projects with companies what I'll do is um, as a first step try to just assess the, 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 how much money is on the table. And one way in which we can do that is by, is by looking retrospectively. Um, we can look at the last five years, say, um, and build a model that says, given that I now know, given that I now know what happened, what would I or what could I have done differently, um, and how much more money could I have made by doing things differently? Um, that gives you sort of an upper bound on the, the maximum benefit uh, that you can get from from having a. a, a a more sophisticated analytical tool that looks forward. In this case, the retrospective model demonstrated um, benefits on the order of 25 million a year to 100, over well over 100 million a year, depending on uh, what kinds of assumptions you put into the model. Um, and this was enough uh, for us to continue. Well, the the problem is. Um, has a lot of moving parts. Uh, the in research, you know, you have to think about what parts. What parts do you really need uh, to answer to address the question? Which ones are? Which ones can you live without? Um, in in BP, in this situation, they have a, a very complex network, a pipeline, um, and terminals uh, around the Midwest um, through which they sell the gasoline. So we we needed to understand the. Uh, how the contracts were structured. 
um, the economic terms of the contract, the time scales of the contract. Um, and in this particular case, the prices in the contract were pegged to an index, uh, which is a publicly available index on gasoline prices. Uh, and so we needed to understand that formula as well and understand something about how price movements in the market uh, impact uh, the profitability of these various contracts. There's a, there's, there's a general uh, movement in business towards applying more analytical models to decision making. And what we see happening in, 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 in industry is uh, mathematical modeling coming into places where traditionally it hasn't been. And so, and so what we see here is a great example. One of the main findings of the work is that if you do this dynamic rebalancing of this contract portfolio, that you can get significant benefits. Um, the idea is that by, by keeping uh, track of the price movements and, and anticipating where the prices across these different channels are moving, you can then make decisions to do a little bit more of this kind of contract versus this kind of contract. Now, these decisions, of course, have long-lasting consequences because if you commit more to this branded channel, you end up having these long-term contracts, which you can't unwind um, anytime soon. And so, you, it, it, so you, you need to be careful before you overcommit yourself. Um, and that's a complicated thing. And how do you, how do you balance that long-term commitment with this you know, shorter-term profit opportunity? Uh, and so that's why we need a, an analytical model to help us, help us sort through that. And we find that by dynamically rebalancing this portfolio, there are significant benefits uh, in terms of increase in profits that you can have as compared to just fixing a static allocation.